The truth about Hedda Gabler. The aestheticism of the 19th century cannot be understood internally in terms of intellectual history, but only in relation to its real basis in social conflicts. Underlying a morality was a bad conscience. Critics confronted bourgeois society not only economically but morally with its own norms. This left the ruling stratum insofar as it was unwilling simply to lapse into apologetic and impotent lying like the court poets and the novelist upholders of the state, with no other defense than to reject the very principle by which society was judged. Its own morality, the new position which radical bourgeois thought took up to parry the thrusts against it, went further, however, than merely replacing ideological illusion by a truth proclaimed in a fury of self-destruction, defiant protest, and capitulation. The uprising of beauty against bourgeois good was an uprising against goodness. Goodness is itself a deformation of good. By severing the moral principle from the social and displacing it into the realm of private conscience, goodness limits it in two senses. It dispenses with the realization of a condition worthy of men that is implicit in the principle of morality. Each of its actions has inscribed in it a certain resignation and solace. It aims at alleviation, not cure, and consciousness of incurability finally sides with the latter. In this way, goodness becomes limited within itself as well. Its guilt is intimacy. It creates a mirage of direct relations between people and ignores the distance that is the individual's only protection against the infringements of the universal. It is precisely in the closest contact that he feels the unabolished difference most painfully. Retention of strangeness is the only antidote to estrangement. The ephemeral image of harmony in which goodness basks only emphasizes more cruelly the pain of, it, of irreconcilability that it foolishly denies. The offense against taste and consideration from which no act of goodness is exempt completes the leveling that the impotent utopia of beauty opposes. In this way, the creative evil has been, since the beginnings of highly industrialized society, not only a precursor of barbarism, but a mask of good. The worth of the latter was transferred to the evil that drew to itself all the hatred and resentment of an order which drummed good into its adherence so that it would or so that it could with impunity be evil. When Hedda Gabler mortally offends the utterly well-meaning Aunt Jewel, when she deliberately pretends the abom abominable hat which the, which the aunt has got herself in honor of the general's daughter belongs to the maid, she frustrated, the frustrated woman not only sadistically vents her hatred of her obnoxious marriage on a defenseless victim, she sins against what is best in her own life because she sees the best as a desecration of the good. Unconsciously and absurdly, she represents against the old woman who adores her bungling nephew, the, abs the absolute. Hedda is the victim and not Jewel. Beauty, Hedda's idée fix, opposes morality even before mocking it, for it balks at anything general and posits as absolute the differences determined by mere existence the accident that has favored one thing and not the other, or, and not another. In beauty, opaque particularity asserts itself as the norm, as a lone, general, normal generality having become too transparent. So it challenges the latter, the equality of everything unfree, but in so doing it becomes guilty itself by cutting off with the general all possibility of transcending that mere existence whose opaque whose opacity only reflects the untruth of bad generality. So beauty finds itself in the wrong against right, while yet being right against it. In beauty, the frail future offers its sacrifice to the Moloch of the present. Because in the latter's realm, there can be no good. It makes itself bad in order in its defeat to convict the judge. Beauty's protestation against good is the bourgeois, secularized form of the delusion of the tragic hero. In the imminence of society, consciousness of its negative essence is blocked, and only abstract negation acts as a substitute for truth. Anti-morality, in rejecting what is immoral in morality, repression, 
inherits morality's, inherits morality's deepest concern, that with all limitations, all violence too should be abolished. This is why the motives of intransigent bourgeois self-criticism coincide, in fact, with those of, mater- of materialism, through which the former attains self-awareness.